All right, this is a quick introduction to how to name sedimentary rocks. We're going to be dealing with naming sedimentary rocks in labs, so make sure that you follow along, and if you have any doubts, check your textbook. It covers these things quite well. Now, that said, your textbook does employ a subtly different approach to naming rocks. Any kind of categorization scheme is... Uh, you know, it benefits from complexity because it captures nuance, but of course, more complexity, well, makes it more complex. So we're going to take a slightly simpler approach than your textbook uses. Instead of using four categories, we're just going to use three categories, and I'll explain those categories now. So think about these categories and why they make sense. Think about what we talked about with the weathering of igneous rocks. So think about the weathering byproducts. So in front of you is a granite. You can see potassium feldspar, or quartz, some kind of black mineral, probably biotite. So think for a second about what those are going to become when you weather them. So our feldspars, if we've got micas in there, they're going to undergo a hydrolysis and they're going to produce what? Clays plus a series of ions in solution. We talked about calcium coming out, potassium, sodium, etc. We can do something with that stuff in solution. But of course, we also have residual stuff left over. If we attack those black minerals, we're going to end up with things like chlorides and stuff, plus some iron oxides around, plus, of course, ions in solution and our quartz. What do you think? It's just being quartz. So the end product, remember, is going to be three things. It's going to be residue, chunks of rock or minerals that are very resistant. It's going to be new secondary minerals that are weathering byproducts. And it is going to be material in solution. So we can utilize all of that to make sedimentary rocks. And principally, I want to think you to think about the, the difference between the physical material left behind, that is the residue and the secondary minerals, and the material that is in solution. So we're going to divide our two categories of rocks into whether they came out of that first category, that is the physical material left behind by weathering, or whether they came out of the second category, that is the actual material that is in solution. Because, of course, anything in solution can precipitate back out. And it can make either the minerals that dissolved, or in the case of something like the ions left over from a hydrolytic reaction, it can make a brand new mineral that had never existed before, something like, uh, something like sodium chloride. <clears throat> so our first category, the stuff left over, that residue plus secondary minerals, those are going to be called clastic sedimentary rocks or detrital. If it came out of solution, we're going to call it a chemical sedimentary rock. Now, there's a third kind of weird category, which are organic rocks. So these are things that were not directly part of the uh, not directly part of the um, of the rock cycle at all. So if you've got a bunch of trees and you compress them, you will make a rock. It's coal. If you get, and I want to be clear, not the actual little shells that I'm showing you here, but the organic material in those little tiny microscopic shells. You can transform that into petroleum, and you can make a solid form of petroleum, and you'll see an example of that in class, uh, which is uh, a solid form of bitumen. So that's our third category, is stuff that was, and I don't mean alive like a shell, I mean we're talking the actual fleshy part, right, or the woody part of the material is being transformed into a rock. And this is really, it's basically coal, but there's a few other weird ones there as well. So when we get into the clastic rocks, we're going to be looking at grain size. But I know that there's obviously mineralogical differences in terms of is it mostly quartz or is it mostly fragments of rock? You know, how mature was it? And we can, in fact, erect different names for it based on that, that compositional uh, aspect as well. But we're not doing that in this class. In reality, though, if you were in, for example, petroleum class or you were a civil engineer, you'd want to know what kind of sand. And in fact, in class today, or I'm recording this on Tuesday, we're going to talk about an extreme example of where the mineralogy of sand made a big, big difference. Okay, so for our purposes, though, we're just going to think about, with that physical material, the biggest parts of it, are they really big or are they really small or somewhere in between? And remember that that transportation process, that erosion and transportation, has the effect that it not only makes things get smaller as they roll around, but it's also going to sort it. And we thought about that when we talked about the ability of, you know, flowing water to hold things depending on its energy level. So let's start off with our smallest material. 
We call these clay-sized particles. Now, they're not always actually the minerals, clays. They can be tiny little fragments of quartz or whatever. Uh, but when we talk about clay as a size category, we're talking about material which is so fine that you not only can't feel it or see it, if you accidentally ate some, and this used to be an old test I'll show you in class, you couldn't even feel the grit between your teeth. It's incredibly fine. We'll often use the term mud and clay interchangeably. And in fact, I usually use mud, but clay, I guess, is technically probably better. So next up, we've got sand. And sand uh, covers a whole wide variety of sizes. If you are someone who has ever used sandpaper, think about every single grit of sandpaper down to the sandpaper that you would use if you were doing final, final, like refinishing if you were doing high-end furniture stuff or like a painter, someone doing high-end car painting or something, they use even finer stuff. But you can't have to buy that stuff specially. If you just buy a mixed pack of sandpaper, they run anywhere from like 36 to 200 grit. If you've never used sandpaper, this doesn't mean anything. But you can see in the picture there that they have different particles. Any one of those is a sand. So anywhere in there, and we would say coarse sand, very coarse, fine, very fine, et cetera, but anything in that grit. When you drop down to the point where you can't really see it anymore, but it's still bigger than clay, we jump into a category halfway between sand and clay that's called silt. And it's about equivalent, if you do any sanding, to about a 400 or higher grid of sandpaper. Basically, you can't feel it at all. You can barely see it if you kind of squint at it. You'll see that with rocks when we look at them. It looks like mud, but if you kind of just squint at it, you can kind of see tiny little dots in there. That's silt. So silt is halfway between clay mud and your very finest sand. You can also go really big. And so again, we can subdivide these categories more, but in this class, we're just going to say if it's bigger than sand size, so bigger than about two millimeters, it is going to be gravel. So anything from the size, you know, of your head down to the size of a centimeter, that's all gravel. So gravel, depending on how much it's been rolling around, will either be very round, right? And we're thinking about the average kind of composition, or it can be very jagged. It has just come just little tiny ways down a stream, or if the process that moved it, like a glacier in this example, does not tend to roll things around. Now, I know if you look at that picture, you can see lots of big things in there. So the biggest size category is gravel, but there's also going to be sand, silt, clay, all of that is mixed together. When we're classifying a rock, we are going to look at the biggest thing that is in there, and we're naming it based on that biggest thing. So with that as an introduction, the naming of these things is actually really simple. Does it have mud or clay-sized stuff and it's a stone? Guess what it's called? It's a mudstone right? or a shale if it breaks into layers. Those are basically interchangeable terms. If it is sand-sized, anything in that grain of the uh, size of sands, and it's a rock, it's a sandstone. What if it's halfway between a mudstone and a sandstone? Well, that's silt size, so it's a siltstone. Now, if you've got pieces in there that are bigger than two millimeters, so they get into that gravel category, if it's rounded, we're not going to call it a gravel stone, we're going to call it a conglomerate, a conglomerate. And easy to remember because think it's round, big particles, and think about the word conglomerate, conglomerate. You make a little O shape with your mouth when you're saying it. As opposed to if you look at the next one over and look at how jagged those fragments are, the word breccia, breccia, cha 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 cha, breccia. It's got that hard, pokey, kind of consonant-rich noise. So conglomerate and breccia, right? They sound like what they are, round class versus angular class. So here's the scheme we're going to be using. And you can see you run from shale or mudstone at the bottom through siltstone, sandstone, and then depending on whether it's rounded or angular, a breccia or a conglomerate. And over to the left are the actual size categories. I am not going to be making you measure these. And in fact, some of them are so small you couldn't measure them. You're going to be eyeballing them, okay? You're going to be eyeballing them. But this is what we're after. Now, next up, we've got our chemical sedimentary rocks. Remember, this is anything that was in solution that came out. And so we largely divide these into things that are basically made of calcite and its closely related carbonate minerals or things that are other minerals. And we're going to be principally categorizing these based on the mineralogy. Is it mostly quartz? Well, we're going to call it something like chert or flint. Is it mostly gypsum? Guess what? We're going to call it rock gypsum. Is it mostly anhydrite? We're going to call it rock anhydrite. So not every name we're going to use is on this, uh, on this table here. I'm going to introduce a few more. Now, note when we look at the calcite-rich ones, our carbonates, you've got other words in there, coquina, chalk, travertine. 
These are about the environment because there are so many different kinds of carbonates, it's worth breaking them out into their texture and into the environment they form. So we're going to do a little bit more complicated scheme for these. So let's go through them in order. Starting with the ones where we're just looking at the mineralogy and not really thinking about the texture. So if you have material in solution and you evaporate it, then material can precipitate out. And the main things, what we call evaporites, the main things that are going to come out are going to be halite, right? Just literally salt, gypsum, which is that calcium sulfate, the hydrated form, anhydrite, which I didn't put on here, but it's almost the same thing. But remember from your mineral lab, it's a little bit harder than gypsum. Otherwise, it looks pretty much the same. It's a non-hydrated form. And then a new thing we're going to introduce, which is potash. So potash is not really a thing. It's a collection of a bunch of potassium chloride minerals, things like sylvite. This is really important because it's the ore of potassium that we make fertilizer out of. So I'm going to talk about this in lecture a little bit more, but I, I want you to reflect on that. That's not in the identification cave. It is in your kit. This thing often kind of looks like granite, but obviously it's made of much, much softer minerals. And to be frank, it tastes salty. Okay, next up we've got our carbonates. So there are two big categories, limestone or the magnesium enriched form called dolostone. They're very similar, except limestone reacts more aggressively to acid and dolostone does not react very aggressively to acid. So the principal way of telling the difference is if you put acid on, does it react immediately or does it barely bubble? You have to actually powderize it, literally physically weather it, weather it create more surface area, then it'll react. Then it's going to be a dolostone. How do these things form? Well, they can form from evaporation. One of the main ways they form is from precipitation out of hot springs. So remember, you can hold more stuff in solution in hot fluid. If you have a hot spring percolating through limestone, it will dissolve the limestone. When it pops out to the surface, a combination of evaporation and cooling down will lead to a deposit on the surface. We call the material that is produced with those hot springs travertine. And you've seen this because it's really widely used as a decorative building material. If you go into fancy subway uh, stations or bathrooms and fancy hotels, you'll often see it. And in fact, the specimen in your kit, I literally just bought from a tile store and smashed it all up. Also, though, of course, precipitate things from biological processes. And this is, in fact, the most important way we make carbonates is organisms and a ton of different organisms, all different groups. They produce carbonate skeletons by using their own energy to pull it out of solution in an environment where it would normally stay in solution. So a little thing on the right you see there is a coccolithophore. It is a tiny little microscopic organism. That is a shot of Alaska from a satellite. You see all that color. That's not false color. That is so many coccolithophores, like trillions of them, growing in a massive plankton bloom that they cloud the water as visible from space. So if you have huge accumulations of these tiny microscopic organisms, you make an incredibly fine grain carbonate rock, and it's called chalk. Literally, a stick of chalk is just this material. The most famous place is here, the White Cliffs of Dover in England, but you can find this stuff all over. So there's chalk. Now, you can have, of course, bigger organisms. So think shells and corals, and you can see these all around the edge of the Bredore Lake. Here's a spot I took from just outside of Irish Cove, and you can see areas where you've got shells in there or voids where the shell used to be, but it's dissolved away. You can also have a rock, which is just basically 100% shells. This one, you can see it shells, but there's lots of fine grain mud size material in between. It's all carbonate, but in between. If you look at this one, this is just entirely shells. And in fact, if you poured water on there, it would just go straight in because there's none of that mud occupying the void. We call this a coquina. So a coquina is a wave-sorted deposit of just pure, usually fragmentary chunks of shell. And here's an example of a coquina that I found. I didn't really find it. My partner actually found it. But this is around Irish Cove as well. And if you see under a uh, close-up view, you can see it's basically made of 100% tiny little shells. These are of strange organisms called crinoids. Now, I said there is mud in between. So you can absolutely have carbonate mud. How do you have carbonate mud? Well, there's two ways. One, you can directly precipitate it. Two, you can have tiny little microscopic organisms that make it. So we talked about coccolithophores, but more commonly, it's, it's tiny little things like calcareous algae. And you've seen this if you've gone to the beach. You weren't aware of it. But you can also get bigger stuff and mechanically break it down. So for example, a parrotfish will actually 
eat chunks of coral and it poos out ground up very fine material, right? It's literally coming out of the butt end of a parrotfish is how you make most of the fine grained uh, calcareous material in a modern tropical environment. So if you have something which is basically entirely lime mud, you would just call it a lime mudstone or you would call it a micrite, a different term we're going to use here, okay? So those are examples. A final thing I want to give you is a weird thing where you get these tiny little balls of calcium carbonate that precipitate in things like caves or tidal lagoons where it's moving around a little bit. Basically think about a snowball made of calcium carbonate. So what you see here is a Roman statue that's been weathered away. I showed you this in class and you should be able to see if you look close, the little spots where the ooids used to be, those little circles, they mostly dissolved away. The final category I want to give you is chert. So chert is a kind of generic term for cryptocrystalline quartz that formed out of solution. So you saw a number of these when you were in the mineralogy section of the course. And if you were a rock collector, you'd give these all different names. So you might call them uh, you know, chert or you might call them flint or jasper. These are basically just color variants uh, of cryptocrystalline quartz. And largely geologists don't care about those color variants. Sometimes we do. It depends on what we're doing. There is one, one specific one, which is flint, which is actually what you're seeing in this picture here. So this is a common rock that occurs along the shores of Cape Breton. We'll talk about where that came from later on, but it specifically forms within chalk deposits. But we can use these things generically. Honestly, in class, if you call them all flint or you call them all chert, I'm not really concerned about that. I really just want you to understand these things are quartz that is precipitated out of water, okay? But where did the quartz originally come from? Some of it was actually silica in solution from those, dis from those reactions we talked about earlier on, or actually even reactions that dissolve silica itself in very aggressive weathering environments. But often it'll actually be tiny little shells of organisms that make their shells not out of calcium carbonate that makes limestone eventually, but actually basically out of glass, out of uh, various forms of a silica, often amorphous, it doesn't actually have a crystalline structure. That can dissolve and then recrystallize, or I guess primarily crystallize, since it was amorphous to start off with, and can make little nodules of material like cryptocrystalline quartz. And here's an example of those nodules. You see the chalk around those little lenses you see there. That's bits of tiny little microscopic organisms that dissolve and then reprecipitate in little spots. So that's your introduction. Those are your big categories. Those are the names you need to know. Our broad categories, once again, are clastic and chemical, with this third category, the weird ones of things that used to be quote unquote fleshy or woody. And those are things like coal. And uh, those are things like coal. Oh, wait, actually, I forgot. I had coal. There you go. That was a good segue. So our final category right here is a coal. Now, again, there's a couple of other ones. I'm going to show you one called Elbertite. It's a weird one. But in terms of total abundance and importance as a, as a product, coal is the most important. So there are two sedimentary versions of coal. The first is bituminous coal. That's what we have in Cape Breton. And it is you know, a reasonably high grade in terms of the amount of energy to ash it produces. And then lignite, which is a uh, less developed form. It's been cooked and squished less. And so it produces less energy relative to its ash content. So it's less desirable. It's sometimes called brown coal. So those are your categories, okay? Clastic, chemical, organic, and remember all those names.